Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 585. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday the 20th of March in the new apocalyptic year of 2020. Okay, welcome to the program. Just stop what you're doing right now and just take a deep breath. Just close all the other browser screens you have in your laptop or your computer or your phone. Turn off the news. Don't look at the Drudge Report, Daily Mail, any of that. Just take a, uh, the next half hour or how long this goes and you know listen to a program. You know, Clear your mind of what's going on out there because it is crazy it's, it's dystopian if i were going to write an amazing dystopian novel this would be it where a small town in the middle of a an asian country way over yonder has an outbreak of a pathogen and it slowly crosses the earth and uh, causes chaos well guess what this is it this is chaos economically uh mentally physically and it's chaos even with the church, and that's something we're gonna to get to discuss today. Before we get too far into the program, this is a great chance uh, to click the like button there on Facebook. You see that little thumbs up on YouTube, like it. It's also a great chance. You know, I was always gonna to subscribe to Anglican TV. Now's your chance. There's a little red rectangle there. You click the red rectangle, a bell pops up, and you click subscribe to the bell and you will get instant notifications every time we publish a new episode. If you have not shared us, now is the time to share us. We hope to be a voice of reason uh, out there for the church, to be uh, very transparent in the news we give, to be very factual in the news we give, and to offer you encouragement while we are glorifying God. So please share us. Now, comments. I think the comment section is going to be taking on a, a little bit more of an element of socialization with us, the three of us, and with you, the audience. I was doing live streams the other day, and I had people uh, requesting prayer. And I think that's perfectly, you know, a worthy thing to do in the comment section. If you or somebody you know wants prayer or needs prayer. Uh, put it in the comments of the Anglican Scripted. And if George, Gavin, and I don't get to it, certainly you know, other uh, uh, audience members will. That's We're Christians. That's what we do. We take a breath, sit down, and pray. And that's what you need to do because you have arrived at the new normal. This is the new world we're in. It, it, it rebooted. without no, Nobody asked me, hey, should I reboot the world? Hey, no, I got nobody. See, George, did anybody ask you if they should reboot the world? No. Gavin, no. And so now the world has rebooted, and everything that was normal uh, four weeks ago is not going to be normal anymore. And so we are going to discuss the new church, which uh, uh, newsflash, the church is no longer in the building. I had some other good quotes here, too, I was going to put up. Um, as we start the show. Now, I'm going to brag here, but Gavin, George, and I are the, the original self-isolators. I have isolated myself 4,000 miles from Gavin for five years and 1,000 miles from George, <laughs> just so we could be safe. Pretend. <laughs> Pretend. <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to talk about kind of the new virtual or the telechurch, um, so to speak, and how people are going to, for some time, be moving into the virtual world. I don't know how long, but I think that's something we certainly want to discuss. First, let's get to um, the initial uh, responses we're seeing globally of the church. Rome, closed. Uh, churches in Africa, closed. Uh, Asia, closed. North America, closed. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to come here because it's dangerous. George, can you give us an update on that? Well, first in the Anglican world, most of the Anglican world is shut down. Uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, Central Africa, uh, South Africa have all 
in various degrees put in protocols ranging from Central Africa's to communion and one kind only to Kenya and Uganda of no public worship services. The United States and in this hemisphere, we from Trinidad all the way up to the Arctic Circle, so worship has been suspended. Uh, I got a little note from the Diocese of the Arctic, they were shutting down. Same day I got something from Port-au-Prince, Port of Spain, in that they're closing down for a month. And the Episcopal Church and the ACNA have both, and the Anglican Church of Canada have essentially all shut down, but they've shut down their public faces. And what they're trying to figure out right now is how to present, how to continue the work and the life of the church in a, in a plague year. And some people are making a good start, others aren't. But that I know what they're taking it seriously. I, Michael Barlow, who's the uh, secretary of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, put out a letter saying, how are we going to count for parish clergy? How do you count average Sunday attendance when you don't have Sundays anymore? And the answer is, we're going to figure that one out, but we urge you to do things online and then try to track how many people watch you online. So either the Episcopal Church is going to have a fantastic year because they're going to have all these inflated Russian bots looking at your shows, or we're going to have a catastrophic year. But, it, but the, the common denominator is, this is not so much uh, what is a health crisis. It is an economic crisis. It is a social crisis. But from where I sit, most of all, it's an information crisis. We don't have the information to know best how to go forward uh, in, the, in our lives together. Well, in my mind, we're, we haven't reached the aftermath yet. We are, this isn't like 9-11 where everything happened in mere hours. The towers fell, the Pentagon bombed. All that just took, you know, maybe 24 hours, and then we're in the aftermath. Here, we're slowly watching this crisis, this pandemic, uh, happen, and it's taking three, four, five weeks. We don't know when it's going to end. We do see, by looking at China, there is an end. There's no more infections happening in China, so we know there's an end. But there seems to be this four or five week period where we have to go through it. And I'm looking at places like Europe and I'm just thinking of the devastation and the, the PTSD that the clergy and the doctors have to go through over there, specifically Italy. Uh, nine doctors died uh, in, in the last couple of days uh, it, and 12 diocese, clergy. Yeah. Diocese of Bergamo. In northern Italy, 28 clergy are in hospital, including the bishop, and 10 have died. Uh, that's north of Milan. Uh, but yes, there are certain parts where I am, there's only one recorded case so far. And they're in perfectly fine in isolation at our local hospital. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are the measures closing the border with Canada, closing the overseas market, overseas airlines, basically it going to be effective? Or are we going overboard, such as in California, where my daughter texted me that she's now been given a stay in place order. She's a nurse at a uh, clinic, at a residential facility, and she's allowed to go to work only. She may not go out shopping. She may not go out eating. She can't take her dog for a walk except around the block. She can only go to and fro her place of employment. Is that going to, and now we can talk about all the devastating economic and social causes but man well, this is a frightening time this isn't i want to ask gavin uh specifically you got all these old empty buildings in the church of england will the church of england survive this will diocese survive this i mean what are what's the impact going to be for some places in england and in britain <clears throat> i've had two conversations in this last week one with a, a church commissioner and one with a, a church warden in the in Derbyshire, the Peak District. And uh, my friend, the church warden, he and I were law students together, uh, and he's married to a woman priest. He was saying that, um, first of all, they have nowhere to go to church, and he's really upset about it. What, what, uh, he was asking me, so what do you do online? How do I access it? Since he's forbidden by his firm to have anything to do with Facebook, that's quite problematic. But he was saying, more importantly, that he doesn't, he seriously wonders whether any of the country churches in the diocese he's in will reopen in 
in three, six, nine, 12 months time, whatever the period of time is, because two things will happen. First of all, people have become confused, demoralized, resentful, uh, and there's no money flowing in. And for so many of the dioceses in the Church of England, at any rate, they were, um, they were living hand to mouth financially. And then there are the 18 cathedrals, which are really quite close to uh, a financial disaster too. Um, what's, what is the situation going to be like? And in one sense, the Church of England is living through the experience and the pain of the rest of society. There are so many businesses uh, and, and people who are employed now who are suddenly unemployed and wondering how they're going to come together at the other end. So we don't yet know how long this is going to take or what's, what's going to happen, but we do know that rather like an earthquake, the shape of everything on the ground is going to be radically different when when we re-emerge. I think part of the trouble is there's so many things we don't know. Why are the deaths in Italy already exceeding those in China? Is it just because they all chain smoked uh, and sung opera when they were young? Uh, or is there a reason we don't know about? At the same time, some people are saying, the World Health Organization is saying that the some total of deaths from flu and pneumonia this year is right down, down by about 25%, perhaps because of the hygiene precautions that the coronavirus has inculcated in people. So although more people will die soon, it's true, at the moment we have fewer deaths at this time of the year. Um, is that a cause for celebration, for confidence? Well, for bemusement, I think. So all we know is that, that um, everything is being tested and shaken, and we don't know what it will look like when we come through the other end, except that I think we have to say that is the Christian experience that we live in a world we expect it to be tested and shaken. We, we you know, the, the canon of scripture ends with, a, with the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Uh, we know we're in for a bumpy ride. And I think one of the things we do as Christians is to say, we have no idea what the end destination on earth is. We know the end destination in heaven. But during the bumpy ride, we learn to behave like church, to love one another, to pray with each other, to develop a quality of trust and living that I think those who depend on the world uh, can't manage and may be looking for. And that, again, will affect our evangelism. Well, well if I, uh, I'm saying, I've seen some of the worst of human behavior and the best of human behavior in the past weeks, and I expect that will continue. I think the rosy picture of the perfectibility of mankind is going to take a really hard knock over the coming months. Um, the Archbishop of Cape Town released a statement to the Af South Af Southern African Church saying, this is not just a European disease. And he released this statement just as there's another wave of xenophobia in South Africa against whites and Asians and because they're being blamed for the illness. The U.S. Embassy in uh, Cameroon and Ethiopia has warned American tourists to go home and also to take care because they have reports of cars with foreigners being stopped and stoned because the locals are blaming Europeans and Americans. And the health minister in Thailand was on the TV the other day saying that coronavirus has been brought to Thailand by dirty Caucasian tourists. So we're seeing a degree of xenophobia that, uh, and of course, we're seeing uh, the uh, anti-Semitism because in the Arab press, this is all being portrayed as a massive Jewish conspiracy uh, to destroy the world. So the, the worst of people are coming out. Gavin uh, was sharing with us uh, some scenes from English life that were just appalling. Please share with us some scenes from English life that were appalling. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the, the scene that most affected me was, your, was an Australian video of two women beating each other up over toilet paper in their, in their, in their trolleys. Uh, and, but, but knowing perfectly well that we've had the same the, the same really bad angry behavior I, actually i i was in a supermarket yesterday and i found myself getting very cross i i won't relay the actual details but it involved somebody buying too much of something and the, and the, the dozy woman at the till not implementing the supermarket's agreed rules um and i found myself getting 
unaccountably cross and thought, well, this is this is this is what trolley rage feels like, <laughs> and, and well, I'm I'm part of the human condition too. I had to I had to pray and to to love and to deal with it. But one of the things we've 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 seen is that um, whether it's the irresponsibility of people still clubbing and going out to drink on the grounds that well, it's not going to affect us. Um, even though we'll be, we may be carriers for other people, uh, or whether it's the the the, uh, the dreadful stripping of the shells. Today in the newspapers, there's a picture of an elderly man. He's 75. He he, he can't see very well. He's looking at his list because he's come out shopping for his elderly neighbours who are 85, and they have asked him to get him a bit of food. So he went to the supermarket to buy a bit of food with a little list, and he's standing there with shells that have been completely stripped by the young and the able-bodied and the well and this leaves a very bad taste in the mouth indeed and it, it speaks to the myth that we have about ourselves and I think George is right that one of the myths that has been prevalent the perfectibility of human beings in fact we're all basically so nice and kind uh, and uh, want to look after our neighbors but actually we seem to scurry around like self-preserving rats when the pressure's put on us ourselves and, and it, it doesn't reflect very well on the human condition, which means that Christians may very well be, be heard a little more clearly when we say that people need a saviour because we're, 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 we're not very kind, actually, cool. as much of the time as we, we think we are. Well, each of us, you know, in one way or another, is also personally affected by this. Uh, my daughter, who's in the food service industry, was moved part-time and, uh, you, you know, may have to struggle financially well we'll obviously help her out and stuff but uh the economy has gone from three percent unemployment to 20 25 percent unemployment overnight and that you know if you ask the average person what their biggest concerns are they're going to say financial concerns um and th those are real fears how do i make my car payment how do i pay rent how do i buy food how do i afford health care Everything's been turned upside down. Not only you know have these people been unemployed, but in th three or four weeks, their health care will run out as well. And then they're going to get the coronavirus, and you know chaos is going to ensue. So we are personally affected. Uh, Gavin got news right before we went to to show. It was horrible, you know. And so my, my I, daughter has just been let go by. Uh, she's she's doing a postgraduate degree supporting herself uh as she has to uh and she's just been let go by the firm no income she'll move home we'll be pleased to see her but the financial implications are hard and as are the, as are the emotional and, f and future ones so um it's not just the church of england it, it, it's um not just the calsons and the ashendons uh, we're all finding ourselves in a position we didn't expect to with a degree of shock and uh, and a realization that it's not going to be easy to rebuild lives in, I guess it has, I guess we're entitled to use the word, an, an apocalyptic scenario. Um, well, this is where faith really counts. Yes, I mean, it, if you um, look at, well, let's, I want to put in the terms of Christian history, this is no big deal. In terms of Christian history, to us on the ground, this is a big deal. This is horrible. This our whole Western understanding of the world is completely upside down in a matter of of hours and days. I, it, you know, it's a big deal, George. Yes, and part of and a lot of this big deal deals uh, has to do with human and governmental failing and church leadership failing. I'm working on an article for Anglican Inc. about the uh, about coronavirus in Nigeria. The bishops of the Church of Nigeria are gathering this weekend tomorrow to install some new archbishops, provincial archbishops, and ordain, uh, consecrate new bishops. Uh, I think that's a uh, risky decision to gather all 160 of them together because the coronavirus has reached Nigeria and it came through the Lagos airport of Nigerians returning home from the UK, from the US, and bringing the virus with them. The Nigerian government has responded by uh, putting uh, ending church services and putting in curfews for, mo for mosques and churches in certain states. Now, in 2014, Ebola entered Nigeria through the Lagos airport, and the 
government was able to implement implement uh, quarantine measures to prevent the spread of this taking place. Since then, the Nigerian government has basically fallen apart under its current administration and has not the resources or the ability to do this. And on top of this, the government, the doctors in Abuja, the national capital, went on strike yesterday because they've not been paid for two weeks, for two months. So you've got a virus just hitting Nigeria this week and the doctors are on strike and the government is not functioning and Nigeria is not the most hygienic place to begin with. What are we going to see in a place like uh, Nigeria? Um, are we going to see a repeat of what we saw in Italy where the hospitals are overwhelmed and the people die uh, because of lack of uh, available treatment facilities in space and ventilators and doctors and medications. Well, Anglicanism here in the West has seen the coronavirus as well. We have a report that uh, Bishop Steve Wood has taken ill and was taken to the hospital with a high temperature. And Bishop of the Carolinas of the ACNA. Yeah, if you would give the story, George. Well, uh, on social media, it was reported, and we've tried to confirm this directly, but... Uh, so we can only report what has been reported by others. Steve Woods, the Bishop of the Carolinas, was taken to hospital with high fever and respiratory difficulties. Now let's extrapolate this by saying he recently met with other ACNA bishops. So the virus, which has a two week incubation period where you don't show any signs of it, uh, the virus has been introduced into that pool of ACNA leadership who are at the lower end of the danger zone, men in their 60s and some with uh, underlying conditions of diabetes and heart problems. So it's it's frightening how it's spreading. That's where there was that Episcopal Church conference in Louisville, Kentucky in mid in mid February and we've been reading about uh, clergy bringing it home to their parishes. Well, new clergy who attended that conference are reporting to the hospitals now. There was a recent one in Morristown, New Jersey, who had to go to the hospital yesterday from respiratory distress, who attended this conference. So it's, and sh this, this priest was fine on the outside for two weeks after the conference. And then in the course of a day, went from a mild headache and a hacking cough to intensive care by the end of the day. So it, what as again i come back to what i said at the beginning of the show it's the information aspect what is knowable and unknowable how does this transmit itself through air droplets what is the incubation period what are the responses how should the church operate mm. our diocese is not formally closed each parish has been given the opportunity to cite its own action some people have the, the bishop has recommended we set up little fm transistors so people can drive and park in the parking lot and listen to the show on their radios that's a way forward. Kevin has uh, put out a video about how to live stream and on Facebook and other social media, your worship services. Um, so we're going to have to figure out how to be church sacramentally, how to be church. We know how to be church pastorally. We know how to be church uh, spiritually, but sacramentally and liturgically, how do you be church? Uh, let me just go on on this. Just I've Apologize for talking to yeah, the, the, the Russian Orthodox Church has just put out guidelines for sacramental worship in a time of plague. And they're excellent guidelines. They combine, you know, the, uh, the forthright statement that where the Eucharist is, is where the church is. And if we don't celebrate the Eucharist, the church is not there. So it has all these strictures and rules about how Eucharist is to be celebrated in times of plague. And they've had 500 years of experience. But church life is not just the reception of the Eucharist. This was a bit frightening, but from, from my perspective. But the icon, relics of St. John the Baptist were brought to Kazan Cathedral in St. Petersburg two weeks ago. And 70,000 Russian faithful have gone to the cathedral and kissed the glass case holding the icons, venerating the icons. And the cathedral reports that a deacon wipes down the case every hour or so as the people pass by. But I wonder how many babushkas are going to be dead in three weeks from kissing an icon where they just went after the person who has the flu and, and got it there. So, again, information. I don't know. 
what's going to happen. Come and on. that's frightening. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can I jump in? <laughs> yes, Babushka. Go ahead. Babushka. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of the of the, uh, the Defense of Babushka League. Um, one of the things that's happened over the last, uh, um, I, I'm not sure how long, but let's say 10 to 20 years, uh, is it been a very interesting phenomenon. And I, I'm sorry to be the uh, permanent injector of the esoteric into this show, but I was I was very interested in it. In the East, uh, so there has been the weeping of icons. It's really quite widespread. Uh, icons have had the Virgin Mary weeping tears. And when they've, uh, again, when they've analyzed this, the the, the the perfume coming off the icons has not been placed there by any ordinary agency. And a lot of people have been saying, well, what on earth is this all about? Why is Mary weeping? And um, the answer was all, has always been, well, we, 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 have, we have been told that things are going to become difficult in, in, in our lives. Now, so things have now become difficult in our lives. And this may be why the icons have been weeping. I don't know. It's for other people. I'm, I'm, I'm reporting at this point. <laughs> Please report. Um, <laughs> now, Gavin, I, I, ha I have to be I have to be the materialistic uh, skeptic. But a few years ago, there was a, a lovely little scandal where the Orthodox patriarch patriarch Cyril was sitting at a desk signing some documents, and you can see the reflection of a gold watch in the highly polished <laughs> surface of the desk. <laughs> but there's no watch on his arm. And some very well-meaning people said, this is a sign from above of the blessings of God. He's being filled with gold and jewelry because he's so holy. Or the uh, press officer airbrushed out his $20,000 Philippe Pate, Pate watch. <laughs> so I... Not I, all is I, as it seems. Not all is as it may seem, but <laughs> I'm, not, no, no, no. I'm not saying that there, you've been having any airbrushes of Our Lady of Kazan, but... <clears throat> Go on. Well, you're quite right, George. One has to be as skeptical as one possibly can in case the uh, watches have been airbrushed as, out as they clearly have. Um, in, in much of the YouTube evidence, many of the monasteries where this has happened have got uh, m monastic clergy looking with astonishment and some, and some uh, unhappiness because they don't want this kind of investigation. They, were, they want to be accused of, of faking uh, holy relics. Uh, it's the last thing they need. And, th and they don't really have an explanation of it. The thing is, however, pretty widespread. And although it's entirely possible uh, that, that some monk with a postgraduate degree in chemistry has found a way of injecting icons from the back with perfume he's managed to find from somewhere, it, this wouldn't be widespread. <laughs> however, well, let's just say... Let's say we, we, we had someone, uh, we, we got the pressure washer out and we were cleaning the walls because this is the spring and mold grows and somebody put it out to me. There was a mold growth on our, our church shed that remarkably looked like Elvis Presley. Elvis. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, perhaps we have some biomedical engineers well, who can... Uh, spray the spores in a certain pattern to give sort of the big hair Elvis picture in mold on our sheds. But, well, uh, I, I want to help out Gavin a little. What you're trying to tell us is that, you know, there's some people who find that the icon is sacred enough that kissing it's not going to cause you disease. Am, you I, am I right in saying that? I was I was very slowly uh, uh, as I tried George, as I tried to dodge George's body tackles, <laughs> aiming aiming for that to cross that line. I am so <laughs> mean. <laughs> so if let let us speak hypothetically, if it is the case that icons have been weeping, if it is also the case that that, that at least half of them are genuine, whilst the other half, as George quite rightly suspects, are complete fakes, <laughs> fabrications. But nonetheless, let's allow a fifty percent authenticity rate to be generous. Um, then, then if there is something, something supernatural in this, as there is in our faith, uh, I, I would, I would be happy to kiss an icon that that was genuinely um, a, a window of God's love and care, and that was displaying some kind of supernaturalism. In the same way that I take the Eucharist, because I believe that the prayers of the priest have supernaturally had an effect. That this is not a Zwinglian piece of spirituality. And I understand that Zwingli is Sounds the savior like of all it. those. <laughs> or, or the Zwingli is the savior of all those whose whose brains will not process this kind of stuff without first race evidence. However, 
um, let's see how many Orthodox drop dead of the plague and how many are saved <laughs> and 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 to save and save unto the faithful the right the right to exercise their faith. Well, I was interested to learn, um, I don't know if people remember this from last week, that it was Pope Francis who closed all the churches uh, in, in Rome. <laughs> oh, that's uh, a body blow. I, no, no, it's not a blow. I just, you blighters. I, 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 just, I, I, was, I was reading this and, um, wait a minute, Pope Francis was the hero for op reopening the churches that I guess he closed. And I, I was, it, was, it was weird to read. And I understand the Roman uh, Catholic uh desire of a the oh, i don't i don't want to use my words wrong but the the holiness of the eucharist and so i was dumbfounded that Pran pope francis if his understanding is roman catholic or not this debate that we're having which which is a, a good and very important debate mm -hmm. is of course the one that the whole church is having we're only a microcosm of the whole church uh, and the the sadness of many roman catholics is that so many of their bishops and theologians and it looks like popes <laughs> have adopted the materialism of of western secularism and much of the church has said but look we have we have the gospels and we have 2000 years of miraculous intervention much of which precisely in order to deal with the georges amongst us has been scrupulously <laughs> examined <laughs> um, oh. and and now at the last minute you want to give up the supernatural evidence to your, to your faith well i'm very pleased to say that that whilst i try and weave past george's body blows on one side and kevin sticks out his foot on the other as i head towards the line uh, we can report that Pope Francis acknowledged the error of his ways. Since none of us has ever said that the Pope is infallible sitting in private judgment by himself, he got it wrong and has changed his mind. Isn't that right, Kevin? <laughs> well, ac actually, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, punch you in the kidneys while you're oh, come not talking. On. <laughs> <laughs> the, We've the become story, the, uh, well, the story out of Italy was that uh, first the churches were closed to worship, then the Diocese of Rome closed everything, including St. Peter's Square, uh, to tourists, to visitors. You could not enter a church to pray. And this and this was done by the uh, cardinal vicar of the diocese. And the uh, order went out, and there was an uproar in the press and in popular sentiment that, you know, we need the church. Okay, we can understand germ theory and this and that, but we still want to go and recite the rosary and pray and perhaps hear a confession at a certain distance. So the order was reversed and Francis was lionized by a certain section of the Vatican press office for being a hero. Well, some Vatican officials then leaked the documents that showed that it was Francis in the first place who closed things and then reopened them in the second. And I'm now, I don't want to, I'm, I enjoy picking on Gavin because it's in good fun, but I respect his belief on this point. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is why I think you should return to Anglicanism, Gavin, because you will never be disappointed in your leaders. <laughs> if you expect nothing from the Archbishop of Canterbury, you will get nothing and you will therefore not be heard. Yeah. yeah. If, I mean, if I wait for my bishop to, to have for, per if I wait for Michael Curry or bishops in the Episcopal Church to drop pearls of wisdom from their lips so that I may be edified, I'm going to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. But here is something I think that is for the traditional Catholics, especially the church in Africa, they've had a double body blow. The Grotto at Lourdes, not only have they emptied the holy water, the Grotto at Lourdes is not closed. The Catholic church, the leadership in Africa, Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, are withholding the Eucharist and the Mass on the orders of the Depart Ministry of Health in their country and taking the lead of the Bishop of Rome. Now, the argument comes from the mostly Pentecostal, but also from Anglican quarters within the Christian world. And the argument goes along these lines. You're saying that an extrinsic item, in this case, the Eucharistic hosts, or the veneration of an icon, can extrinsically transmit to you something that is holy and spiritual, that gives you eternal life and pays the path to life eternal in Jesus Christ. We Protestants, whether we're Zwinglians or what have you, Calvinists, Lutherans, or Anglicans who have no clue what they believe, we believe that it is an internal, it is an internal, not extrinsic. The internal is spiritual. 
so that when we don't have Eucharist, we are not lesser people because that spiritual communion, it is what is central and it's symbolized or memorialized. So what's happening is that people like Cardinal Sarah, the Cardinal from uh, Guinea, who was one of the great lions of the traditional movement. He's a, he's a wonderful fellow. He is having two things happen. He is being undercut by the Pope, who is essentially saying that this really is a memorial, that you need to basically take proper hygiene methods to make sure you don't get sick. And his basically he has more in common now with uh, Patriarch Cyril of Moscow that he does with the Bishop of Rome. Yeah. And this is causing, and this is basically allowing evangelicals in Africa and in South America and in Asia and in India to say, look, we've told you this is hocus pocus and black magic. Hocus pocus comes from a Scottish uh, Latin, uh, yeah. Latin membering of the opening words of the Eucharistic prayer. We've told you this, it's spiritual. And now your own leaders are saying this. So I'm not saying that they're right. I'm just saying this is what's being said. But I think it's a pretty harsh, hard hit. Did I get you in the other kidney gap no, with that one? Or? Well, I, I, no, no, George, I, won't you? Yeah, just take a minute. Uh, no, no, t <laughs> take a minute. Uh, respond to George. And then I, I need to pay compliments to uh, live streaming and uh, your role in it. Um, you are sweet. Um, George, George, this is a very good conversation because it really is bringing to the surface what we need to talk about and what we need to decide. Um, so uh, effectively, you're quite right. This is a struggle between, if you like, the supernaturalists and the materialists, those who think that there is something intrinsic in, in the Holy Eucharist and those who think it's taken more a receptionist point of view. One of the reasons why I became a Catholic was because my local bishop, who is on the Cardinal Sara team, said, we have this fight in the Catholic Church. Gavin, you're wasting your time fighting it as an Anglican because they don't believe very much anyway, but this is the fight we have to win. Please come and join us and help the supernaturalists mm -hmm. win. Please help Sara beat the Pope effectively. Uh, or what, what, the, what Sara stands for, and the bottom Pope apparently stands for. I have to say the Pope appears to stand for both sides, which is a matter both of regret and cheeriness. Um, uh, we now, discussed this on the Peronism issue. Uh, we did, we did, we did indeed. <laughs> but the right. reason where this becomes extremely interesting, I think, for all of us, is that uh, for some time now, I have thought that the materialist position is likely to crumble, and that the two supernaturalist churches, which I think are effectively the Pentecostals, uh, and the and the Catholics are likely to stand. I was talking to uh, I was writing to the leader of a of a Pentecostal group in England who was planning to have a consultation for, for prophetic voices in in the summer, which they just cancelled because um, everyone's cancelling everything. Well, for the same reasons that we're going to hear Lambeth the Lambeth conference is cancelled <laughs> soon. And he wrote to me, and we were discussing exactly this point, and and he said. Uh, I guess we, we, you know, we look like we're the Pentecostals, but I'd like to call ourselves Pentecatholics because we're learning to be sacramentalists. And I thought this was a wonderful phrase, Pentecatholics, because this is the fusion of supernaturalism and the healing of the Reformation that I, I really long for. So, George, you're right. There is a fight right down the middle of Catholicism. It's everything to do with materialism versus supernaturalism. We don't know who's going to win it yet, but but since I think that Jesus was a supernaturalist and I've joined his team, uh, I'm very I'm, I have great confidence that we will win it. But that's the issue, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what comes out in the wash at the end. Well, but, if I may just push you a tiny bit, Gav. Mm -hmm. If you go <laughs> to no, the pandemic, you, if if you go into the ministry of the Catholic Church, you'll be a man under discipline. You yes. will not have the freedom, uh, and you'll you'll be fortunate because you'd be incarnated into a diocese that has a good bishop. The difference, and woe betide you should you be moved uh, fifty miles north or a hundred miles south, because the freedom that you had as an Anglican to speak and not agree with your bishop's uh, injunctions on these issues will evaporate. And part of the part of the uh, uh, well, I use a hackneyed phrase, the glory of Anglicanism is the liberty of conscience. Now, when conscience is good and proper, then that's a wonderful thing. Uh, 
but oh, it's part of the, not universal. George, you, you provoked me to say in this theological tennis match that part of the glory of the Catholic tradition is the humility of obedience, and I look forward so much to exercising it, or rather learning to try to exercise it. Well, it, it but <laughs> that was a very good point, uh, Gavin. I mean, my Roman Catholic uh, people that I do look up to uh, find obedience uh, to be one of the reasons they're there. Uh, and yeah, they struggle with the, some of the theology. They struggle with a lot of things. They don't struggle with the obedience. And you know, I, I think that's right. your friend, your friends must not be Jesuits then, Kevin. No, but I, I want to transition <laughs> back to that pandemic, and I want to compliment uh, what I'm seeing on Facebook right now. Uh, early on, I uh, when this started happening, I started getting emails. Kevin, what's the best camera to buy for live streaming? Kevin, uh, this, 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 this. And so I said, let me do a live stream on how to live stream. And the first day I put the live stream up was Tuesday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Within 12 hours, I'm watching priests put their evening prayers on live stream and then their morning prayers. And then people are putting notices up. Our worship services are going to be live streamed. And I'm good friends with the uh, persons uh, whose first morning prayer I watched on Facebook, Gavin, uh, and you you knew that this was a, a ministry a long time ago. No, I didn't at all. I was sitting in a church on Easter Sunday, mm -hmm. complaining to God about um, uh, about my my rustification, so to speak. And I heard a voice in my head. I mean, everyone will, who talks to Jesus will know it wasn't a voice and it's not my head. But nonetheless, I had the strong impression I was being spoken to. And we had this argument. Uh, he said, you know, go and do prayers on the Internet. And I said, Lord, this is not fair. You'll make me look like a Pharisee. You know, he, I love to stand in public places dangling my my bits. Uh, and I said, I, you know, this is I a hope not. <laughs> <laughs> my phylacteries. I'm so sorry. And I, I, I said to him, really, you, you know, I, I will look like an egotistic idiot if I do this. Um, but but he was insistent. And so, yes, so two years ago, this started. Uh, and I feel a bit like the older son now. Um, uh, here are all these people who've just jumped onto my bandwagon and are doing it much more successfully than me, much better than me. And and do I get no credit for this, Lord? And the answer is, no, of course you don't. You just were obedient. You did as you were told. Well, um, I, so <laughs> I was watching one of my feeds, and there's this 70-year-old-ish priest guy, and he has text in his live stream. I'm like, no. that's just showing off. <laughs> You know, it's one very, thing to turn your tough. iPhone on, but now people are doing subtext and CCs. Gavin, Gavin and, and, if I uh, may, you, you need not worry because um, I'll tell a funny little story that doesn't reflect credit on uh, some me. Uh, I, I shared with our clergy in Central Florida Kevin's uh, instructions how to do live streaming and this and that. And then about on our clergy listserv, and then about two hours later, the bishop sh shared an email, oh, we're doing this too. And uh, on the diocesan webpage, and if you actually look at Kevin's versus you look at the diocesan, well, I, I, I think you'll see a difference as to usability and functionality. And this speaks to what uh, we call Q in this business, the, the, that undefinable quotient of what will get people to watch you. One of the one of the problems Kevin and I have had over the years, it's not a problem, but one of the learning curves we've had is that there are some people who are just fantastic writers, but they are absolutely dreadful on camera. We, we call will it the, yes, we will put them on and they will cough and hack and wheeze and go, ah, and they just don't ha or they'll be wooden or they'll talk too loudly or too much. They don't have any connectedness. So what you're going to see in the next few weeks, you're going to see an explosion of really dreadful worship because um, it, it's what happened. I'll give you an analogy from show business. When people moved from the theater to the movies, many of the early stage actors just were dreadful on film because on stage you have to overly uh, dramatize your mm -hmm. movements, your mm -hmm. gestures, your facial expressions. But then once you get on the small screen or on the movie screen, it's a different skill. And being able to speak in front of a congregation is not the same skill as being able to keep and hold people's attention on the small screen. And one of the things that Kevin has been able to do is to teach people like you and me, Gavin, through tr 
because we've had so many years experience how to work well on the small screen. So all these people jumping on the bandwagon, it, it's a good stopgap, but it's but not I, going to replace their Sunday public worship because they don't have the and skills. I, and I'd like to spiritualize this too, because you're quite right. You you do have to use as many skills as you can, as in as in everything in life. But but the really powerful element is the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the things that has absolutely blown me away, and I wish I could publish them, but they're too private. Uh, are, are the constant stream of emails, dozens. I mean, that I don't know if dozens is big or small, but but every time I get an email from someone who's been saved, I mean, they, they, they're so, they, they have turned to Jesus, they have moved out of confusion into clarity, out of the desert into the oasis that is God's love. And, and every time I've got one of these, <clears throat> I've said to myself, you know, everything I've done in the last few years has suddenly been made worthwhile by what's happened in this one person's life. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, at one conscious level, I had no input whatsoever. I, 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 uh, all I've done is to um, offer the liturgy and, and um, reflections on homilies, which, which frankly are, are not very good when you listen to them. Um, but, but because of the Holy Spirit, uh, there's been a connection between Jesus and the waiting heart, which only Jesus can fix. And, and the reason I'm saying this is I want to encourage all our clergy not, not to be um, held back if they live like me, their technical skills are rudimentary, or if like me, their, 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 their preaching is pretty pedestrian. But just to do it, put put Jesus out there in any way, because he will have he will have made you someone whose ministry can touch this other person's heart. There will be a, 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 a piece of alchemy, a piece of chemistry between you and the Holy Spirit. And it only has to happen to one person and everything is justified. And I think one of the great things about the internet ministry is not that we have 75 year old men doing what I can't do yet, which is to bring text down onto the screen, which is very clever, but but that we, we really do have a whole new amphitheater for allowing the, the 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 miraculous saving presence of God to touch the human heart and bring people to heaven, and all of us can play our part in it. It's it's really quite wonderful. All right, gentlemen, I do need to cut it short. Fifty minutes. Uh, <laughs> we need to get back to the that pandemic. I'm Kevin Coulson. I am the scourge of Catholicism, George. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus said he is the resurrection and the life. And meanwhile, I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 585 of Anglican Unscripted on the 20th of March, the third week of Lent in the year of the apocalypse, 2020.